We are here to discuss hermeneutics, and we're going to be here today and also next Saturday. Well, Saturday for people around our parts, Friday night for people around um, in the U.S. and where Pastor Rich is. And as we think about the issue of hermeneutics this week, Pastor Rich is going to talk to us a bit about more on the foundational principles and concepts of hermeneutics, and he's actually going to show us how that all works out when it comes to interpreting a specific passage or expositing specific passages of scripture. Now, before anything else, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Rich and have him introduce himself, Pastor Richard Barcelos. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, Richard Barcelos, I'm the pastor of Grace Reformed Baptist Church, Palmdale, California, which is in Southern California, Northern Southern California, <laughs> or Southern Central California. And uh, I'm married, five children, three grandchildren. And if you hear my grand granddaughter crying, it's because she got up early this morning and was a little cranky. Um, I also teach for IRBS Theological Seminary and uh, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And Steve Gonzalez is a good friend. Yes, thanks for that, Pastor Rich. And uh, Pastor Rich has written several books as well. I think about um, the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. Um, recently, he came out with a book called Trinity and Creation. I think I got that right. Yes. And um, I got that on ebook and I've been working my way through that. I really appreciate it. And I think a lot of the books that uh, he has written, um, although he, he hasn't written a hermeneutics textbook and that might be in the works, I don't know, you tell us. But as I read his books, a lot of them definitely uh, touch on the issues of biblical interpretation, uh, what scripture says about how we must interpret scripture, and then the history of interpretation as well. And I think as I look at the notes that Pastor Rich has prepared, we, we're going to get into a lot of what people have said about biblical interpretation and what the biblical authors themselves have said about that. So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Rich now so that he can begin with uh, part one out of our two-part series as he speaks about biblical hermeneutics and some of its technical terms. Okay, thank you, Josh. Um, I want to thank you for putting this together as well as uh, Stephen kind of behind the scenes. I should thank Sean Sacolo from our church because I'm just here he pulls the string, I talk. <laughs> he sets all the technical stuff up. I don't do that. But it is a privilege. It's, a, it's an honor to be asked to do this. And I'm not taking it lightly. I spent some time thinking about how to approach it and tossed and turned several nights. And hopefully what I'm going to present will be helpful. This week will be more uh, theory, principles. You can get it. Somebody's at our door. And then next week, I'll apply some of the things, some of the principles um, we discuss this week. So that's what I'm hoping to do. So uh, technical terms this week, and then um, I'll expound a text of scripture, uh, actually just part of a verse next week, but I think it'll illustrate just about everything we're discussing this week. So. I would like to pray before I begin, and then we'll start. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. We pray for help for all of us, for our minds to be keen, sharp, to be able to understand, especially for me, to um, simply and clearly articulate the matters before us. And especially when we go to texts of scripture, may things become clear by your gracious work in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I have entitled the first session, Biblical Hermeneutics and Some of Its Technical Terms. So I have a question, actually a twofold question. What does the word hermeneutics mean? That's pretty important. And why is the study of biblical hermeneutics important? So what is hermeneutics first? And then why is the study of biblical hermeneutics important? 
So simply put, the term hermeneutics refers to principles of interpretation utilized while interpreting verbal or written communications, in our case, uh, written communication. By biblical hermeneutics, I mean the following. The identification, the explanation, and the utilization of theories or principles of interpretation which best assist us in understanding the Holy Scriptures. I'll read it again. The identification, explanation, and utilization. I'm going to do all three of those. This week, identify and explain. Next week, utilize various theories or principles of, of interpretation which best assist us in understanding the Holy Scriptures. It is very important to recognize that the principles necessary to interpret, for example, the front page of the newspaper. Does, does anybody know what a newspaper is today? Yeah, Sean says, what's a newspaper? Uh, the principles necessary to interpret the front page of the newspaper and the principles necessary to interpret the written word of God, though there's some overlap, they're not necessarily one and the same. I was trained in such a way, at least my brain, my memory remembers, you interpret the Bible just like you do any other book. There's a small problem with that, namely, the Bible is like uh, no other book. There's no other book that can pair with it. One divine author and a various human um, uh, authors, and uh, the unity of the whole depended upon the fact that God is its ultimate author. So I think we'll see this, what I'm trying to distinguish here, general hermeneutics, principles of interpretation that we use for any and all types of literature versus what some people call sacred hermeneutics, uh, or the principles we use uh, sometimes mind out of the Bible itself to interpret the Bible. In other words, uh, when we read the Bible, we see that the Bible interprets the Bible in places and in various ways, and that becomes a model, an infallible um, model uh, for us to emulate. So in these two sessions, I'll be using uh, technical terms. I think we have four, four or five today. Uh, I'll define them, illustrate them. And since I'm using technical terms, it's only right for me to do so, not just use the technical terms, but to define it. Uh, sometimes, I, I had one person at one time, a long time, who said, I don't like the, the pastor's Sunday school classes because he, he uses technical terms. He makes me use my brain too much. I think all week, I just want to come to church. You know? And uh, might come back to that now. Then I got, you know, probably sinfully bad, offended, all that stuff. But now my comeback would be, have you ever listened to R.C. Sproul? <laughs> One of the reasons why people like R.C. Sproul is he uses a term and he stops and then he usually does, you know, this history of the word and it's a compound word. He talks about the preposition that's connected to it. And, you know, he does all that stuff. And by the time he's finished, you get it. You get the concept embodied by the term. And then he, when he uses it in a context, boom, the lights go on. Well, I'm certainly not R.C. Sproul, but I found that helpful. And I, hopefully this will be helpful for you as well as we define these uh, terms. Um, hermeneutics requires uh, us to think about theories and or methods of interpretation. And that's what this session will be concentrating on. It'll be theory heavy, principle heavy. I'll illustrate them as well, but next week will be more of a practical application. So uh, this evening, some technical terms connected to biblical hermeneutics. Now, uh, this is not going to be typical, at least for a lot of people. Uh, I'm not sure about my audience, but a lot of people where I'm from, when you study basic principles of hermeneutics, the, you know, one principle would be um, understand the context, which I think is important. Understand what goes before, understand what goes after. I get it. Authorial context, uh, uh, you know, a section context. Uh, is it a paragraph, uh, chapter context, book context, author context, testamental context, you know, canonical context? There are various layers of context. I'm assuming you already believe to do that, okay? Um, so what I'm doing is looking at principles. Some of them are embedded in scripture itself. 
Others, some of these are not unique to scripture, but I think they help us interpret scripture. So the first one is called intertextuality. And if you've never heard that word, you know the concept once I read a definition. Here's a definition from the, uh, what's called the Pocket Dictionary of Biblical Studies, a little tiny thing published by InterVarsity Press. I think I bought a bunch of those little pocket dictionaries used 10 or 15 years ago. They're very helpful. So here's how they define intertextuality. Ask yourself, have I ever seen this before in writings? The phenomenon that all texts are involved in an interplay with other texts, which results in the interpretive principle that no text can be viewed as isolated and independent. In other words, you can't do this. You have to do this. At some level, all texts are, are related to every other text. This interplay is particularly true of biblical literature. Ah, see, intertextuality is not unique to the Bible, but it's particularly true of biblical liter literature since each document or text, you could say book, is self-consciously part of a stream of tradition, of a canonical tradition, either a, a prophetic tradition or an apostolic tradition. The study of intertextuality pays attention to the fragments or echoes of earlier texts that appear in later texts, examining texts that share words and themes. Now, I realize that's a mouthful, so let me try to unpack it a little. So the basic thought here is that biblical texts are at some level involved with all other biblical texts in revealing a cohesive story. And the reason this is the case is uh, these prophets and apostles and the apostolic men, the non-apostles that wrote New Testament books, are agents of God. And God is the ultimate unifier of all that they say. So this can be illustrated, for instance, in the sharing of words, uh, phrases, concepts, and themes from from earlier texts by later texts. You read through, especially the Old Testament, by the time you get to the Psalms and then you get to the prophets, they're picking up earlier words, phrases, uh, concepts. They might use different words sometimes, but you know what they mean. We'll look at that in a second. So with reference to the Bible and in, in, in its uniqueness, intertextuality is assured by the fact of inspiration, divine inspiration, and this is due to its divine author. This is very important. Uh, we believe that God is the sovereign creator. He makes the, everything not God. He sustains, and he also acts in the world he creates. And one of the actions of God, one of the works of God, one of the effects of God in his creation is the production of scripture uh, so that we believe in divine providence. And that ensures the unity of scripture. And that gives the biblical intertextuality an added element to it that other, uh, other works of literature don't have. By the way, if you've ever read John Owen, there's intertextuality going on in John Owen's writings as well. And the same goes for anything you write or I write. But again, the Bible is unique. The unique aspect then of intertextuality in Holy Scripture is not to be found in the human author's products, uh, even assuming they, were, they wrote with the canonical consciousness, which I think they did. But the unique aspect of scriptural intertextuality is find, found in divine inspiration. Divine inspiration endows or gives the word of God written a type of intertextuality unknown in any other written documents. The Holy Scripture has various human authors, we grant. Their writings display an intertextual relationship with one another. They borrow terms and phrases, later writers, from earlier writers and concepts. But it is not the human character of the scriptures that ensure a distinct type of intertextuality among the writings of the various human authors of scripture. The distinct type of intertextuality 
is due to the divine inspiration concerning the final written product of scripture. You could say this, scriptural intertextuality is divinely inspired. God did this. God picks up terms, phrases, sometimes verses, concepts from previous revelation or antecedent revelation or earlier texts. He picks them up in later texts. God's doing this through the, the prophets and the apostles. And it's ultimately then God doing this and not merely men making use of the written word to further explain its meaning. We'll see that this happens. Uh, subsequent scripture sometimes makes explicit what is implicit in antecedent scripture. If, by the way, if you memorize that and you understand what I mean by that, you got it. You can actually go. Um, I hope I'll illustrate this uh, further in our discussion. So let's look at the second term, interbiblical exegesis. Interbiblical exegesis. The same dictionary defines interbiblical exegesis as follows, an approach to the text that seeks to address the reinterpretation. Many students of mine know I hate that word. I'll talk about it in a minute. An approach to the text that, that seeks to address the reinterpretation and reapplication of earlier biblical texts by later texts. Direct quotations are the most obvious application of this method. This approach to texts shares features with scripture, uh, with interpreting scripture in light of scripture. So the basic thought here is this. The Bible sometimes interprets and applies the Bible. Wow. That's pretty important, though, if you think about it, because it's God. Um, it's God interpreting God's word by virtue of a new word from God. I said I didn't like the word reinterpretation uh, in that definition. It, it, to me, it seems to allow for later texts casting new meanings back on earlier texts. Uh, you have a text over here in the New Testament that quotes a text from the Old Testament. And a reinterpretation could mean, and it does for some people, in light of Jesus coming, old texts now have new meanings. Uh, if you and put that on a test, I would give you an F on that one. Um, the writers in the New Testament didn't reinterpret, didn't cast uh, new meanings back on old texts. They interpreted Christ in light of what the texts already meant. And Christ himself interpreted it himself in light of what the texts already, uh, already meant. So we must admit that interbiblical exegesis, uh, at least we ought to, it's no small phenomenon of Holy Scripture, uh, assuming it exists, which it obviously does. So given the divine inspiration of the final product, the word of God written, if and when interbiblical exegesis occurs, the sense derived from an earlier text by a later text is infallible, sense inspired. That's pretty important. Let me say that again. If and when it occurs, the sense derived from an earlier text by a later text it is infallible since it's inspired. In other words, sometimes we have the word of God on the word of God and inspired and therefore infallible interpretation of the word of God given to us by the spirit of God in the word of God itself. I've said this before. When you have the word of God on the word of God, you've got the word of God on the word of God. And that's pretty important. God is through agents, through revelatory uh, agents, the apostles interpreting ancient texts and applying them to a new situation. Situation brought in by the great redemptive act of God Christ. Now, here's a one example. For instance, Matthew cites Hosea 11.1 1 in Matthew 2.15. So let's 
Uh, let me read Matthew 2, 13 through 15 and make some observations here. Now, when they had, appeared, uh, had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose, I almost said, and Pharaoh is going to search for the child to destroy him. <laughs> We've heard that this story is, has uh, reverberations, echoes from the Old Testament. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that what was spoken, now watch these words, by the Lord through the agent, through the prophet, might be fulfilled saying, and here's the quotation of Hosea 11, 1, out of Egypt did I call my son. Now, we're not going to get into all the details of what's going on here and all the different views that the scholars might have. Uh, but I will say this. I think at least three things ought to be uh, agreed upon. First, the word of God, in this case, Matthew 2.15, cites the word of God, right? That's pretty simple, Hosea 11.1. 1. Second, the word of God, Matthew 2.15, is interpreting and applying the word of God, Hosea 11.1. 1. There, there's an interpretation of an ancient text going and an application of it going on here. And third, the word of God's interpretation, that is, Matthew 2.15's interpretation of the word of God, that is, Hosea 11.1, 1, is inspired, therefore, infallible. That's pretty important. That is the case, and I think it is. Every time a scripture author not merely cites a text, but in the context, you can tell he's interpreting and applying a text. Okay, so because it's one thing to cite a text as a, an ethical principle or a proof for an ethical principle that he's trying to deal with. It's another thing to say something like this. This happened in order that what the prophet said would take place would occur, you know, has happened. So that's called the this is that motif. That's all over the Gospel of Matthew and the book of Acts. Let's keep going here. Hopefully this is making sense. If it's not, I guess you can blame Pastor Josh and Stephen Gonzalez. Illusion, illusion. Uh, G.K. Bill, who's an American Presbyterian Reformed uh, theologian, he defines illusion as a brief expression consciously intended by an author to be dependent on an Old Testament passage. So he's talking about uh, illusions in the New Testament. Now, differentiating between quotation and illusion, Beale says, illusions are indirect references. Okay, so it's not a quotation. We just saw a quotation. Hosea 11, 1 was quoted in Matthew 2, 15. One thing that illusions teach us is that the writers of scripture possessed uh, a, what I'm calling a canonical consciousness. Uh, New Testament authors allude to old, the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Old Testament authors allude to books in the Old Testament as well. There's allusion uh, within the Old Testament to itself. There's allusion uh, within the New Testament to the Old Testament, there's also, I think, uh, several places in the New Testament that alludes to itself. If, uh, if we have time, I'll try to show you some. But all of this shows that there's this, there's this canonical consciousness uh, through the agents, the organs of revelation, the agents of revelation, the prophets and the, the apostles, they realized they were part of a tradition of writing down things that had authority. So the Old Testament, by the way, is full of allusions to itself. I, you know what? I, I don't think I've ever found a scholar, I'm sure they have, though, give a number of how many allusions are in the Old Testament to itself. But you know this. It frequently gives an indirect reference um, to antecedent events, uh, institutions, places, and or persons. And to illustrate that, I think one of the more frequent allusions in the Old Testament uh, is to the exodus from Egyptian bondage. 
especially toward the end of the Old Testament. And by the time you get, we get to the prophets, they can refer to the Exodus by just saying, when God bore his arm. Right? Sean smiled at that. Because immediately what comes up in a scripturally saturated mind is, I know when that happened. It happened in that great event we call the Exodus. That's just an allusion to an event uh, triggered by the use of two or three words, not necessarily a quotation. Now let's consider allusions to the Old Testament in the New Testament. So what is meant by allusion, just to be clear, is a passing or a casual reference or an incidental mention. This will be illustrated below. You might ask the question, if you're not asking it, I'll ask it. How many allusions to the Old Testament are contained in the New Testament? If there was a live audience, I'd ask for a number. There isn't, but I'll tell you this. Roger Nicole, who was a scholar from the last century, Reformed scholar, goes so far as to claim over 3,500 allusions in the New Testament uh, to the Old Testament. But let's drill down a little farther into the fact of scripture allusions before looking at the New Testament. Let's think about this. The presence of allusions in either Testament teach us that the writers of scripture had a revelational and canonical consciousness. They realized that God had revealed himself to us in the scriptures that predated them. We could put it this way, texts of scripture often assume previous texts of scripture and enter into conversations with them without quoting them. So let's consider the first verse of the New Testament, Matthew 1.1. Believe it or not, I think there are at least five examples of allusion in the first verse of the New Testament. Let's go through them. The book of the genealogy, I think is the first one. It's an allusion to or echo of Old Testament genealogies. The book of Genesis, which is the foundational book of the Old Testament, upon which the rest is based, contains several genealogies. Uh, we could add to it the purpose of Matthew's genealogy is to show the connection between Old Testament redemptive history and an individual agent of redemption, our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament then assumes the Old Testament and builds upon it, fulfilling its promises and pursuing its expectations. The very first words of the New Testament illustrate this. A second, the word Jesus. Is this an illustration? Uh, is, is this an allusion to the Old Testament? Well, in Hebrew, uh, the language of the Old Testament, Yeshua is Joshua in English, and it means the Lord saves. And Joshua, if we think through Old Testament chronology, is a key figure in the history of Old Testament people of God and uh, is the title of the sixth book of the Old Testament. You remember, Joshua took the people uh, of God into the promised land because Moses failed, Moses sinned. Joshua took the people of God into the promised land and conquered many of her enemies. They crossed the Jordan with. Joshua, or by virtue of his leadership. He was the leader of God's people just after Moses led them out of Egyptian bondage, the Exodus. Now, I just have a question. You'll know my answer. It's just a question. Could it be that Joshua was a type, finding as his antitype or the fulfillment uh, in a greater Joshua who would take the people of God into the eternal state, Emmanuel's land, that to which the rest of Canaan pointed? And if you read older writers, they'll all say, of course. Well, how about the Messiah? Is that allusion to the Old Testament? I think it is. It's an Old Testament concept that refers to the Lord's uh, anointed suffering servant. Now, the servant oracles, especially in the prophet of Isaiah, might come to your mind with a suffering servant. By the way, there's suffering servants who do suffer for doing what is right all over the Old Testament, but they're all sinners. This is the suffering servant anointed by the Lord who did not sin, the Messiah, who's promised in many places in the Old Testament. And Matthew later argues that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. So this allusion brings to, brings to our mind the 
promised fulfillment motif found in many places in Matthew's gospel and other books of the New Testament. So there are three allusions. I think the son of David is another allusion. This is not a quotation of the Old Testament. But if you know the Old Testament and you're reading Matthew 1.1, I think this would be your fourth uh, allusion. You go, yeah, son of David, that comes from the Old Testament. It's a phrase which finds its literary taproots. It's the scripturally literary taproots or it's canonical taproots in 2 Samuel 7 12 and following and Psalm 89, the Davidic covenant. The New Testament clearly sees a promise fulfillment motif functioning with reference to David and David's greater son. And then I think the fifth uh, allusion here is the son of Abraham. If, again, if you're saturated with the Old Testament and then you start the first verse uh, of the New Testament, you're going to, you're going to, your mind's going to be triggered. Your mind's going to hear connections, uh, see, and then see connections, hear connections. Well, however that goes. So I, I think this is safe to say the very first verse of the New Testament alerts us to, uh, to its literary and theological association with and dependence upon the Old Testament through allusion. This is not quotation. The New Testament also contains allusions to itself. There are several. I am going to skip that section. Let's go to the last one, and that is typology. By the way, all of these are, I, I purposely grabbed these four principles because I want to illustrate these four, especially next week. But let's think through typology a bit. Typology is very important. So I want to offer some brief thoughts on typology as an introduction. And then I'm going to give a few introductory principles uh, uh, regulating typology. First of all, typology is not allegory. Typology is not allegory. Uh, allegory, properly understood, is actually, uh, first of all, a genre, a, a genre, sometimes people say, a genre, a style, uh, a, a way of writing. And that is indicated by the use of metaphor or extensive metaphor a lot of metaphors are extended metaphor and it uh, allegories don't require the text to be presenting a historical person or a historical place historical institution or historical event uh, we might say according to the letter some people see for instance the song of solomon as an extended metaphor an allegory uh, some people see and i uh lean this direction i do the song of solomon as well many of the the, the parables of our lord they're, they're it's an it's an they're allegories now, that scares a lot of us but if you just understand it as the use of metaphor and extending those metaphors to tell a story then you say oh well, if that's what it is okay well it is the particular baptist um benjamin teach has a big two volume set on the on the parables and he has some good, wonderful uh, comments on the genre. At times, Jesus used allegory. Jesus used metaphor. Jesus used words and phrases that depict one thing, but they were, he, he, he was depicting another thing by a, a, another word. Uh, sheep. Are, uh, are Christians sheep? Yes, but that's a metaphor. That is a figure of speech for a human being, sinner, saved by grace, who's united to Christ. So typology, unlike allegory, assumes his, the historical reality of the person, the place, the institution, or the event of the text. And typology as well assumes that God intended to typify or prefigure something by the person, place, institution, or event revealed in the text. And the reason why it does that is because once a type is revealed in the Old Testament, um, we're not necessarily told it's a type. But when we read the rest of the Bible, there are analogies of that thing that we haven't called a type that convince us that was a type. Sometimes the scripture itself identifies those things as a type with, they were, with the word tupos or type. Um, not always, as we'll see next week, especially. So, for instance, the type, Adam, is not a type because uh, the word of God written makes it such. Now, that's weird. 
But in Romans 5.14, it says that Adam was a type of him who was to come. But hold on. Did Adam become a type when Paul wrote Romans 5.14? The answer is, well, we'll, we'll no. So prior to the type being written about as a type, it was instituted by God to be a type. In other words, types are not made by God telling us they are types, but by God instituting them as such via a divine act prior to the inscripturation of the act itself or the type. God makes types by virtue of his providential acts, not by virtue of his word written. That might blow your mind. Let's keep going. Let me give you a few introductory principles regulating um, typology. First, a type is a historical person, place, institution, or event that was de designed by God to point to a future historical person, place, institution, or event. We have something back there that points to something over here. Something in the old that points to something in the new. Example would be the sacrificial system revealed to us in the Old Testament. That's pretty clear. That institution was designed by God to point to Christ's once for all sacrifice. By the way, what came first? The, sacrifice, the sacrifices uh, actually offered or the writing down of the Pentateuch? Did you realize that some, when I talk about the sacrificial system, I said of the Old Testament, it's not just the Mosaic Covenant I'm talking about. There were sacrifices prior to the Mosaic Covenant, right? And those predate the written word of God. So, um, which is very interesting, um, which means that they were instituted by God, designed by God to point to Christ's once for all sacrifice at their institution, not at their inscripturation. Sean got it, so I'll keep going. Second, that to which types point is always greater than the type itself. Okay, so you have the type over here, and that to which it points. This thing's always greater. Something greater than Solomon is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. Remember Jesus saying that? That's typology. We'll look at some of one of those statements next week. So in other words, there is some sort of, uh, what they call it is escalation in the anti-type, in the fulfillment. For example, the blood of bulls and goats could point to Christ, but they could not and do could not and did not do what Christ's sacrifice did, take away sins. Third, types are both like and <clears throat> unlike their antitypes. There is both correspondence and escalation. Uh, for example, the blood of animals was shed. The blood of Christ was shed. There's correspondence. The blood of animals did not take away sins. The blood of Christ takes away sins. There's escalation. Fourth, antitypes tell us more about how their types function as types. That's a mouthful. Uh, the blood of Christ takes away sins. The blood and of animals pointed to that. You know, once the fulfillment comes, it's almost like the Old Testament uh, is illuminated. Uh, the Old Testament isn't changed, it's illuminated. It's, a, it's a, in the language of B.B. Warfield, it's like a dark room with just a little lit candle. But when fulfillment of all of that to which the Old Testament comes, then the light shines back and things become clearer. And fifth and finally, types are not their antitypes. Types, bulls and goats, are not Christ. Nor are types as types of the essence or substance of their antitypes. The animals, the bulls and goats, couldn't do what Christ did. If they were, or if they could, they would be, they would be their antitypes or make their antitypes redundant. If the, the blood of bulls and goats could expiate guilt, could take away sins, we don't need Christ. So there would be no escalation in the antitype and thus would negate the type as a type. Uh, and this gets a little technical here, but we'll just keep going. Though types may also be 
symbolic of some present and real spiritual reality for believers, in other words, they can function sacramentally, this does not mean that they are of the essence or substance of that to which they point. For example, the blood of bulls and goats is not Christ's blood. Though the blood of bulls and goats may function as symbols of the blood to be shed by Christ, which is efficacious for believers of all ages. I know that was a little technical, but what we're going to do is explore typology in more detail next week from a text of scripture to try to illustrate all this. Now, I have to draw a conclusion because this is supposed to go between 40 and 45 minutes, and I'm not even sure when I started. So here's my clue, conclusion. From the terms and concepts we've studied thus far, it should be, <clears throat> should be clear that in order to read and understand the Bible as God intended, not only will we see things like intertextuality, interbiblical exegesis, illusion, and typology, we need to find the best way to account properly for such things. Okay, I just showed you that it's there. But we have to account for why this is happening and how they did what they did. So by accounting properly for these things, I do not mean acknowledging their mere presence. That's one thing. I just showed you their mere presence. I mean, we need to acknowledge both their presence and account for the way or the manner in which these things appear. That's way different than saying, oh, intertextuality. Oh, interbiblical exegesis. Oh, illusion. Oh, typology. That's good. But we have to go farther. We have to say, well, how does all that work? Now, to whet your appetite, um, hopefully, consider 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Let me just read this passage. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Let me just stop there because it's hard for me not to ask the question. Are there any allusions to other scripture there? Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ, Messiah, died. A lot of animals died for our sins. The old Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. According to the scriptures, and then verse 4, and that he was buried, I think it's implied according to the scriptures, and then, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, here are my questions. To ponder, mostly tonight, and to prepare you for next week when we're going to look at uh, verse 4b, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So here's the whetting of the appetite, hopefully. First question is this. To what is Paul referring when he says the scriptures? I'll, let, I'll put Sean on the spot. What do you think he's referring to there? The Old Testament, Sean says. If I had a bell, I, I'd ring it for you. Correct. To what is Paul referring when he says the scriptures? And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Second question. Does Paul quote the scriptures? Here. The answer is no. He's not quoting the scriptures. Third question. Does Paul allude to the scriptures? Yes. Fourth question. Does Paul assume meaning from the allusion to the scriptures? And that he was raised on the third day. And this being raised on the third day was in accordance with the scriptures. Paul's not citing a scripture text from the Old Testament. Paul is alluding to the scriptures, plural, not one text, but the, I think the entirety of the Old Testament uh, teaches this. But what specifically is the meaning that Paul seems to be alluding to in terms of the Old Testament. Uh, it is this, that the Old Testament teaches the third day resurrection of the Messiah. Of course, we have to then ask the question, 
does it really? Because if not, Paul was wrong. Of course, we're going to answer it really does. And then we have to ask the question, well, how does it do that? Paul's just alluding to the fact that it does. He's very confident here. His death is according to the scriptures. His death for our sins. His burial is according to scripture. And his resurrection is according to the scriptures of the Old Testament. So what we're going to do next week is uh, delve into those questions a little more. Probably other questions a little. uh, uh, Other questions as well. And uh, that will be our next session where I try to illustrate all this stuff in the exposition of the last part of 1 Corinthians 15, 4. So with that, Josh, I'll, I'll give it over to you. Okay. Well, we'll move on to our Q&A now. Thank you again, Pastor Rich, for, uh, for the presentation. And um, you definitely, I think, whet our appetites for uh, <laughs> for next Saturday or next Friday night for you. And we do have quite a few questions coming in now. So I'm just, I'm just going to go ahead and throw them at you. Um, we'll have a few people who are, we have a few people raising their hands so I can let them speak. But I want to ask, firstly, on behalf of my wife, she typed in a question. Uh, and this is my wife's question. Um, she asks, several times you mentioned older authors positively. Uh, why is that? What was, what was the negative shift which seemed to have happened uh, that you, you might be alluding to? Oh, something's exploding. Uh, that is an excellent question. Tell your wife that's an excellent question. I will. She's, so um, let me make sure I understand this. I mentioned older authors. That assumes a shift at some point. What's the shift? The shift we call uh, in the Western world is the was the Enlightenment. Uh, John Gerstner, who was R.C. Sproul's mentor, called it the Endarkenment. <laughs> um, naturalistic um, worldview came in. Creation was no longer a creature. It became uh, nature on its own, independent of a creator. God was only not creator. God was obviously then not providential ruler. So that scripture became a a religious book about ancient people, Jews, and then first century Christians. And so a denial of divine inspiration. One of the things that actually came out uh, as a result of the enlightenment was um, this, this attempt to interpret documents. Um, where uh, the interpreter tries to, um, well, this is one of the things that came out, tries to rid himself of presuppositions and just be alone with the text. And um, that's impossible. So what happened was uh, people started to assume they could come to texts without assumptions and um, just read it naturally and get, uh, you know, the plain sense of the text. Uh, you're going into the interpretive laboratory of, for, of scripture on the way in. You rid yourself of all assumptions. You're now a blank slate. It's just now you and the Bible. Uh, that's impossible. We all have assumptions. We all have presuppositions that we can't shake. The older writers that I'm talking about, Uh, lived prior to the Enlightenment, and so they had more of what we now call a Christian worldview. And they believed that we have to come, not only do, should we come to texts um, uh, with presuppositions, we need to come to the text of scripture with the right ones. And they got primarily the right ones from scripture itself, so that um, they did kind of the, some, some of the things I'm doing. They're looking at this, these, these uh, phenomenon going on, these happenings going on with the text of scripture itself, uh, intertextuality, uh, interbiblical exegesis, illusion, typology, and they're going, God did this. God put this book together. And so I have to read it, uh, assuming one divine author ultimately using, you know, the agents, the the prophets and the apostles. So they had more of a theocentric view of interpreting scripture. It's a God thing. The the pre-modern 
the pre-enlightenment authors, they, I, I don't think I can, I've ever read a pre-modern author going, I wonder what the original historically conditioned minds of the original recipients of Paul's letters believe this to mean. That's a very modern question. You got to get into the mind of the human author. How do you do that? They're dead. Yeah. All you have is their text. Well, but we have secondary literature. This is enlightenment kind of stuff. We have secondary literature, literature behind the scriptures that fills in the gaps for us. That's true. But a lot of the historical data we have that fills in the gaps for us is very, has very slim, uh, very slim textual basis. And none of the secondary literature we have, whether it's old or relatively new, is in inspired, therefore not infallible. And a lot of the secondary literature that we have, you know, a little fragment off of a rock in a cave from the second century, was could have been copied down wrong by somebody, was interpreted probably by a non-Christian non archaeologist at some point, and then it's passed on from one author to another, and just a lot of stuff falls through the cracks. So those kind of questions are very modern. That's why when I say the older writers, uh, they were more theocentric, the unity of scripture because of the one divine author. They uh, assumed a certain metaphysic of reality, called philosophical realism. We're not going to get into that. Uh, but anyway, I'm going too long. That's, that's, that's my answer to that. Excellent question by your wife. Your wife's the, obviously the theologian in the family, right? Yeah, well, she really is. She really is. <laughs> All right. Next question is from one of our church members, and he has his hand raised. So, Ilya, uh, I'm going to allow you to talk now so you can ask your question. Um, thank you very much for um, the uh, conference, Dr. Barcelos, and for teaching at CBTS. I've benefited greatly from it. Um, I've got a question that you seem to have assumed in your presentation um, uh, for clarification. So um, the question is, can we interpret the Old Testament in the same way as the apostles did? So um, at times you would say, oh, well, Paul is interpreting, um, uh, you know, things here. Uh, Matthew is interpreting things here. Uh, but how do we counter the objection that the apostles could make exegetical leaps due to their inspiration that is that are unavailable to us and then how does the reformed doctrine of inspiration figure into this yeah that's a good question too so um some of this i might cover next week i'm not sure so the you know there's an issue uh, with the old testament uh, in the new. And the issue is this. When you study some of these passages, for instance, like Matthew chapter 2, um, and then you go read Hosea 11, 1, even if you read it in its context, you might scratch your head going, what? This is about Jesus? And so some people view Matthew's use of Hosea 11, 1 as under, uh, you know, an inspired penman whose product was inspired, therefore infallible, so he can make these exegetical and interpretive moves because you know God is with him in this unique way, but we can't make the same moves. We shouldn't interpret scripture uh, the way the apostles can. Now we the way the apostles did. Now we can't interpret scriptures the way the apostles did in their written documents in one sense because they're written documents, the final products are uh, inspired, therefore infallible. But if we can determine how they got to their conclusion, how could Matthew dive back in the Old Testament and use Hosea 11.1 1 to, uh, to say that you know, this was God in the Old Testament actually predicting what he would do with reference to his incarnate son. If we can figure out what needs to be in place for Matthew to do that, um, I think we can, we should, and we ought, and everybody before the Enlightenment thought the same thing, uh, that we ought to utilize the principles that the apostles did. Because the principles basically that the apostles used, I think they learned from Jesus. Um, I, I, I have a friend, 
we're kidding about writing books on hermeneutics sometimes. Um, and I would call mine Lordship Hermeneutics. Uh, because if you follow Jesus, the way Jesus interpreted the Old Testament, Jesus interpreted himself in light of the Old Testament and its meaning as it stood before he came on the scene. Jesus doesn't reinterpret the Old Testament and make it mean something it never meant. The apostles don't reinterpret the Old Testament and make it mean something God never intended it to mean. The Christological and the apostolic interpretations of the Old Testament are the divine intent of the texts of the Old Testament prior to the writing of the New Testament. Uh, and if you hold that view, and that's my view, this, this is a long answer. Then, of course, the next question is, well, what has to be in place for, to, for, the, for the apostles to do, uh, Jesus to interpret the, the Old Testament the way they did? One of the things has to be that God designed the Old Testament to prepare the world for the Messiah, and it's full of types. I've said this before to students. There's probably more types in the Old Testament than, than we feel uh, comfortable with. Uh, by the way, an excellent book to help on this is 40 Questions on Typology and Allegory by Mitch Chase. Uh, and I will argue next week that a type can be a type without the Bible telling us it's a type. And I'll use three illustrations next week of that thing, that very thing. So that's that's kind of my muddled answer. Sorry it wasn't as clear as it could be. Well, we might as well do next week's lecture right now. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we'll have to wait. Thanks for that. Well, uh, we the thing about the thing about the uh, thing about typology is just mentioning is, uh, for instance, I, I was trained that a type is a type when God tells us it's a type in His written word. The only types that are types are types identified as types with the word type in the Bible. Okay, something like that. Um, and I used to hold that. I, I just don't think it works. And next week's uh, session, um, I'll, you know, I'll challenge that way of thinking, not in a rude way, I'm not trying to fight anybody, but uh, in a positive way, I think that what we look at next week, we'll have to conclude, you know what? There are some things in the Old Testament that are types of Christ that aren't identified with the word type. So next question, thank you. And I second the um, recommendation for 40 Questions About Typology and Allegory by Mitch Chase. Great book. Next question. You read that book? Yeah, I'm uh, on the second to the last chapter. Man, you know, when I first read it, when he, uh, well, he sent me the pre-pub manuscript because he asked me to endorse it, and I'm reading it. I read it fast. And I read about, I don't know, two, three chapters, and I'm going, he reads the same books I read. I said this in my lectures in a different way. So that was cool to do that, and we've become friends, so. I highly recommend that book. Yes, great book. Next question is from Ruben Thomas. I'll read it for you. Um, are all antitypes Christological? Meaning, do all types point to the person, life, or work of Christ? Well, that's a good question. Uh, let me ask this. Do you, do you think, Ruben, uh, that the promised land is a type of the eschatological state, the new heavens and the new earth. If you answer, I, you don't have to answer. I don't want to put you on the spot. But if you would answer yes to that, then you have a place that's the type of a better place. Now, how do we get from the place with all its faults to the better place? By virtue of the sufferings and glory of Christ. So the antitype is still dependent upon Christ, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever had that question answered, asked before. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, yeah. Um, Israel was the a type of, if you take this view, if Israel, in some sense, was typological of the church under the New Covenant era, uh, then you have uh, a non-Christ, um, person of Christ, um, anti-type. But again, that antitype doesn't become what it is without the, the virtue of the work of Christ. So I, I bet you if we just kept teasing these things out, we'd always say, but again, without Christ, you don't get the antitype, even though he himself in his own person uh, uh, might not be the antitype. But, so that's it.
By the way, just, just so you know, some people believe Jesus himself and his person is the, is the fulfillment of the land promise of Abraham. Isn't that? Now, it's weird to us, okay? But I have, a, I think, a good friend who actually holds that. I'm sure he has good reason for it. Next question. Thank you. Uh, next question is just as good. It's from someone named Alexander. What does hmm mean? Well, that is an excellent question. Uh, Alexander must see that on Twitter and or Facebook. It means whatever I want it to mean in the context in which it's, met, it's used. Um, so I'll sometimes somebody will say, what does that mean? I'll say, let the reader understand. <laughs> I use hmm for just about you know, everything. I, I tried to pull a, a trademark off on it. Somebody already had it. Yeah, so it is sometimes it means I agree. Sometimes I'm astonished. It just depends. It all depends on authorial intent. Yes. And I don't always uh, let the secret out in terms of what I intend by it. <laughs> All right. Um, from our good friend, Stephen Gonzalez, he asks, Dr. Barcelos, can you give us some good resources that will allow us to dig a little deeper into our studies of hermeneutics? Thank you. So you've already given the 40 questions on typology and allegory. You might have some other resources you'd recommend. Yeah, um, the, the 40 questions on um, typology and allegory does a lot. Now, uh, if you're like me, when with my background, the word allegory was scary to me. It's still scary because it's uh, easily abused. But Mitch Chase did a good job. He does a lot in that book. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh, but I think it's a pretty readable book, right? It is. Yeah, very readable. Um, a more technical book that's had an impact on a lot of people, including myself, is Craig Carter's book, Interpreting Scripture with the Great Tradition. Um, that's a challenging read, uh, but it's an excellent read. Uh, a simpler book, simpler book, a smaller, an older book that messes up a little with, with post-Reformation, Reformed Orthodox guys, is, I still like uh, Louise Burkhoff's um, Interpretation of Scripture, or whatever it's called. Biblical Interpretation. Does anybody know the title? Good book. I have students read it. Uh, it's very well written. It's very well outlined. It has study questions, and it's not very long. I don't read. I got tired of reading more contemporary uh, books on hermeneutics. Not all of them. But in my um, reading, uh, many, if not most of them, I hope nobody's listening, were boring and got into all sorts of um, speech theories that, oh, there it goes, um, speech theories and all kinds of stuff, um, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the liberals and philosophers, and that has its place in academia, but just for, you know, pastor and especially for churchmen, I, I just got tired of it. And then a, a lot of the contemporary uh, in books on hermeneutics, um, it's very, they don't realize it, but it's very modern. And um, they, ha they believe in the modern, very modern theory that in terms of scripture meaning, the meaning of the text is exhausted by the human author's intent of the meaning, which again, I can't know his intentions. I can know, you know what he wrote. That's very modern. Uh, God is the author of scripture. God's ultimate meaning is, uh, is the meaning of the text. It doesn't go against the human author's uh, text at all. But, uh, so I don't read the contemporary ones. Let me just illustrate what I was just trying to say. Is God free to do something? Creation, let's say. Raise up a prophet, Moses, to write about it. And then later, tell us more about that act of creation recorded by Moses to tell us more about it, and even quoting Moses' own writing. Can God tell us more about a divine act subsequent to not only the act, but subsequent to the first writing of the act? And the answer is, whether you like it or not, of course he can. He does it all the time. Subsequent revelation often makes explicit what is implicit in antecedent revelation. God acts. God records an act. 
and sometimes God tells us more about the theology embedded in the act than he did in the first text that he told us about the act. So um, that's kind of a pre-modern way to think. And I think that's the way we need to think. By the way, if you have an older hymnal, they all write hymns that way. Your favorite hymns can't use a modern hermeneutic. The older hermeneutic not only brought to birth the great hymns of the Christian faith subsequent to the, Revelation, uh, to the Reformation, but the, the older hermeneutic and theological method also gave birth to the creeds, the great confessions, and, uh, uh, and catechisms of the Christian church throughout its history. You can't get there with, um, with the modern hermeneutic. So, excellent question. I, I have a follow-up that's actually related to what you just said. Um, regarding Wait a minute. Yep. Hold it. You can't ask questions. <laughs> it's the Are people. you sure? I'm here to serve the people, not you. <laughs> I'm people. I <laughs> You're in charge. You can do what you want. <laughs> yeah, I will do what I want now. So um, I'm going to ask my question. Uh, related to that, the, the issue of the difference in hermeneutics, there, there are many conversations that kind of go this way regarding hermeneutics. There's the literal, historical, grammatical method, and, and that's great because, you know, say something like Martin Luther uh, rediscovered that and helped him interpret scripture properly once more. And then it's, it's what a lot of people are doing that they call uh, Christocentric or Christ-centered or, or whatever it is, kind of hermeneutic. And they, they kind of dichotomize the two and they would say, well, what, what those Christ-centered guys are doing is they're, they're inserting Jesus in the Old Testament where, where he's not supposed to be there or where he's not actually there. Is there a dichotomy between historical, grammatical and, and reading the Old Testament in light of Christ? Um. Well, I like the way you put it because the way you put it was you acknowledge that some people do pit the two against each other. I don't think there is necessarily. Uh, what I think, and this is what I do in my lectures, is I cover the principles of grammatical historical hermeneutics. And I argue that those are good as far as they can go. But if you don't include along with that a larger canonical scope uh, to shine on the text, then you haven't gone far enough. So, um, so I, I teach both, and you know, this Christocentric thing, um, I think it was Spurgeon that said, I'd rather find Christ where he isn't than not find him where he is or something like that. Uh, you know, so it can be abused, obviously. Every red thing in the Old Testament is the blood of Christ and, and all that, which, by the way, a lot of the older writers didn't have a problem with that, you know. Um, but if you think about the Bible, let's think about the Bible. Why did God give us a Bible? Well, to to uh, instruct us on how to have a better marriage. John's making faces. It's only because he's singing. <laughs> uh, why did God give us the Bible? So that we could have good ethics for businesses and civil magistrates and churches and, you know, all those things. Uh, why did God give us the Bible? Well, to create Christian dentists. God gave us the Bible because sin is, it exists in the theater of man's experience, and God has a plan of redemption. Um, and God's plan is to recapitulate all things, bring all things under a new head, because the first head, the first creation, Adam, failed, and that is Christ. So if God's purpose, his macro purpose, is the recapitulation, this is Ephesians 1.10, is the recapitulation of all things in Christ under him, friend and foe, going to glory, going to judgment, then what would the Bible's purpose be in light of what we know from the Bible itself about this recapitulation? The Bible's purpose would be to tell us how God is going to go about to do that in the sufferings and glory of the Son of God. We have a Bible because sin is, and God has a plan of redemption. It's the story of redemption. It's not the story of Israel, stop, they messed up, then the church, uh, they get raptured, then Israel again. It's a story about the redemption of sinners for the glory of God through the, the work of the incarnate Son of God and bringing many sons of God to glory against all odds and all enemies. If that's what the big scope of Scripture is, or actually, the target, the goal, the end to which it points, redemption through Christ for the glory of God, 
then all its parts somehow, some way serve it. And if that's the case, we're going to be more Christological uh, in our understanding of things. For instance, you know, uh, uh, the, the three offices, threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Where did that start? I think it started in the garden with the first Adam. If it did, Adam's the first prophet, the first priest, the first king, and he failed, his threefold office, or his three offices, and he failed, um, that is going to condition the way you look at subsequent prophetic office, priestly office, and kingly office. You're going to connect it to Adam, and they're all going to be failures, by the way. And then when you start reading the prophecies about prophet, priest, and king coming, and see it in its fulfillment, it, it, it all makes sense. So uh, if we know that God's ultimate purpose uh, with this creation, given the presence of sin, is the recapitulation of all things under his son, then we already know what the Bible is going to be about. It's going to be about how God goes about to do that. Uh, I, I think that's the best way to look at scripture. Otherwise, you get all, on all these detours and, you know, you feel the Old, the old Testament's Judeo-centric. You know, I heard of a, a contemporary man, great man, uh, very great man. God's used him greatly. Um, say that in, in the last five or 10 or 15 years. The Old Testament's Judeo-centric. It's like, have you read the New Testament? It's pretty Jesus-centric. Uh, uh, and the apostles wrote in light of that as well. So I'm rambling because it's getting late. <laughs> so go ahead. Next question. Thank you for that. Um, there's an interesting conversation happening um, in the chat, actually, regarding one of, the, one of the anecdotes you gave. I believe it was from Spurgeon. I'd rather find... Christ where he isn't than miss Christ where he is. And that's, I guess that's, that um, is a little bit connected to our next question, which is from our friend, Brett Lee Price. And if you're in Australia, um, you should know that our friend Brett is with Tulip Publishing, a great publishing house. So if you're within Australia, you should be supporting these guys. They're doing some great stuff. And his question is, how far do you think we can legitimately take typologies and potential Christophanies? How far is too far? And I guess to connect that to, um, there's people making comments, they love that quote from Spurgeon. What, what do you think of that? Um, is that a good sentiment to hold? Or holding that sentiment, could it possibly lead you to a, a, a bad direction? Is there a demarcation? And we, should, we just can't go further than that when it comes to seeing Christ. Yeah, I, personally, I, I, I don't, I laugh when I quote that. I'm not even sure if Spurgeon said that. If he did, I, I, I wouldn't say that. I don't teach my students that. Well, this is the issue of controls. You know, how do we control our typology? I tried to give five principles there uh, in, in the lecture earlier. Um, we have to see some sort of correspondence, some sort of analogy in subsequent scripture you can't, I, I think it's unwarranted just to go someplace and say this is necessarily a type. However, I think there's more types than I, I realize in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, some people don't want to call, make Joseph a type. By the way, you can't make Joseph a type. Either God made him a type or God didn't. Is Joseph typological of Christ? Well, there's a lot of parallels there. But Joseph, David, the same thing when they're young. Uh, and their family doesn't like them and all that kind of stuff. So it's the controls is the issue. And in the courses I teach, I try to teach the controls. And the other thing is um, the history of interpretation should help, should, should lean on it as well. Read John Gill. When you're doing uh, passages and you're wondering about, well, whatever you're preaching, I, I try to read John Gill all the time, especially in the Old Testament, because Gill has an encyclopedic mind. And he quotes Jews and he quotes Armenians, not Armenians, well, he quotes Armenians too, but Armenians. And he, he writes in Syriac and in, 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 in intertestamental Judaism. He's doing what Beale does now. Owen and, and, and read Owen too, but Owen and, and um, Beale already did that. And, and just to see how they went about interpreting texts uh, it's fascinating sometimes, and I think we can learn a lot from that. So, uh, you know, controls is always the issue uh, that 
people are going to fight over. So, but I, I don't want to fight with Brett Lee Price. Uh, I'm supposed to actually go see him sometime. Uh, so whatever you want to believe, it's fine, brother. Yeah, we hope that happens, and then we hope we can we can steal you for a while and make you go down over here. All right, so we've got a couple more questions, um, and then and then we'll we'll cap it off. We don't want you to stay up late. What time is it there? It's four thirty in the morning. No, it's <laughs> seven twenty nine. Seven twenty nine. Four thirty. Seven twenty. Whatever. Close yeah, that's not that's not too late. Um, <clears throat> so. There's a whole bunch more questions about typology, but you know what? I will we'll we'll leave that aside because I think we've talked a lot about typology, and uh, you might be going to do typology next week. Yeah, so there you go. You're going to do more typology next week. Um, so there, <laughs> there's another question by Brett, and I don't know if you, if you want to um, tackle this head on, but his question is: How would you personally contrast the main hermeneutical grids between the He's, he's referring to it as the Christotelic versus Christocentric positions. And he's, he's getting really specific uh, as epitomized by the Master Seminary versus the general reform tradition, respectively. Uh, I know that you have insight to that. So that's something you want to speak into. I'd be happy to answer that next summer when I'm at Brett's house. <laughs> Wise. I'm kidding. Okay, now, he's making a distinction. I think it's a, uh, an important one between Christocentric and Christotelic. He can correct me if I'm wrong, but I have come to understand that this term Christotelic, which I actually know that G.K. Bill used it positively, approvingly, uh, I think 10 years ago or so. I don't think he would now. Christotelic has now been, uh, is now, in my thinking, a school uh, in, which includes some reformed guys too, that view the Old Testament as upon a second read, read through the Old Testament, read through the New, it now points to Christ because you know the end of the story. The texts on their own prior to the incarnation, sufferings, and glory of Christ, the raising up of the apostles and apostolic men to write the New Testament, the texts of the Old Testament on their own, without all that, uh, might have meant that to God, but nobody else would have figured it out. Didn't mean that to men. A, a more of a historic uh, Christ as the scope of Scripture or Christocentric view um, views the Old Testament as God's intention all along to reveal the promise of the Messiah through the written word and by the spirit, bringing that effectually uh, to the souls of people. So that texts uh, that we are told in the New Testament, uh, texts from the Old Testament that we're told in the New Testament are about Christ, were always about Christ. They didn't become about Christ on, after Christ came. They're already about Christ. I think if you read the New Testament, especially the Gospel of Matthew and the book of Acts, you'll, you'll realize the Christotelic thing doesn't work because the way they're interpreting the text of the Old Testament is that this current event, not the writing, of, in, uh, not that which is written in the book of Acts, but that which the book of Acts wrote about, this event, this historical event, or that which the Gospel writers wrote about, not their writings, but who they wrote about. Christ, this is that which the prophet said would take place. So the this is that motif is true, uh, irrespective of uh, the New Testament being ever being written. But of course, we know it's been written. So Christ was the fulfillment of the text that the New Testament tells us he was prior to the New Testament telling us he was, which means the text meant that before this text, the New Testament, said they meant that. So I don't know if that helps, Brett Lee. Uh, Sean seemed to, to like it, and uh, um, I should probably stop talking about that. It's a good question. Yeah, I think it was helpful. Um, since all the rest of the questions are related to typology, we're capping out that, and I get to do what I want and ask my last question. Um, since, since we... We assert, you assert that the 
the apostles uh, would have learned their hermeneutics from Jesus himself. And uh, basically what we're seeing is, is the way Jesus himself sees scripture and handles scripture. It, it has to be true then that the, the first generation Christians or even the second generation Christians that followed in the footsteps of the apostles would have, would have caught that, would have taken that on board and would have approached interpreting scripture in a very similar way. And I want to end just by asking you, is that from, from your understanding of early church history, is that what we see? Uh, is that indeed reflected in the first few centuries of the church? And if it, if it is, then it means that we can learn so much about how they did that. Did you read that quote I put up of Keith Sandlin? Or I don't forgot his name. On Twitter? Yeah, I, I, I did. You want me to pull it up? Okay. Yeah. No, you don't need to pull You can pull it up if you want. But here, here's the, that's a great question. And the answer is, uh, yes, you can see a continuous stream of interpreting the Old Testament as pointing to Christ, apart from the New Testament telling us to. Read on the apostolic preaching by Irenaeus. It's fascinating. And read other apologists uh, trying to convince the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. You know what they don't quote, or they rarely quote? The New Testament. They try to do it on the basis of the Old Testament uh, itself. They are arguing for Jesus of Nazareth as the suffering servant promised on the Old Testament, on the grounds of the Old Testament itself. So, yeah, you see the same thing. You see uh, uh, the same basic hermeneutic that the Old Testament on its own taught both the divine unity or the monotheism and also uh, the incarnate suffering servant who would suffer for our sins. So yeah, the answer is yes, you see continuity there. The discontinuity, and of course, you know, in subsequent church history, you got somebody like Origen who, who goes way off at times and even there are others, you know, people really love Chrysostom. Sometimes I think Chrysostom boring. I love uh, uh, Cyril of Alexandria. He's great. Uh, Augustine's really good, too, on the Gospel of John. But, but you know, you see different, just because there are abuses doesn't mean uh, the use of the thing is wrong. You know, a good thing overdone gets undone. It doesn't make the good thing ungood. It means somebody misused it. So we need to be careful throwing the baby out with the bath water. And uh, if you want to read that quote, you can. Sure. Do what you want. No, Do well, what you want. Your call. I, I, <laughs> I posted the quote in the in the chat group, and people can see it. And okay. I just I wanted to mention that he he makes a very strong statement, which is that he 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 was referring to Keith Sanglin was referring to what many um, in the modern day say, which is that the apostles were were unique in the way they interpreted scripture, and we're not supposed to model that. They did exegetical leaps because they were inspired authors, and we we are not, so we can't copy that. And then he makes this statement. He says, no one in the early church understood exegesis this way. So he actually right. says that. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably, that's one reason why I posted it. I was going through, oh, I was preparing for this, and culling through my lectures, trying to gather material. And I found that and I thought, ooh, that's good. I need to put that, remind people of it on Twitter. So I'm glad you saw it. I'm glad you read it. 